Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Neil and I, we sat down and discussed uh, my, my problem first, my teaching problem first, and then we did Neil's after. And actually, the two things were uh, not seemingly related, so we have dealt with them as two separate issues. Um, so the first thing that I am... Um, um, that we tackled was uh, my next teaching um, challenge will be to uh, explain the concept of um, organisational innovation and creativity um, not necessarily in the creative industry. So I'm trying to teach design students how uh, non-creative organisations can actually be innovative, um, how they can um, be agile, how they can um, do things that other companies seemingly are, are unable to do. So how do I do that? Um, and one of the big things that we kind of thought about was the problem that you have is um, it's easy to explain how a person is created or how uh, a product is created is innovative, but when you try and explain it in, in the wider context, so you're not talking about an individual, but you're talking about something that's kind of intangible, like an organisation and, and the things that go on inside its school, um, it's much harder to do and it's much harder to make those students realise. Um, so what we kind of boiled it down to was when we talk about innovation, what we're really talking about is learning to do things in a new way. Okay? So how do you explain to students this process of learning to do things in a, in a new way? And what we did was we decided that the ultimate thing that does lots of things is a multi-tool. Not the best multi-tool we could find, but... So what we would do is, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give the multi-tool to the students and I'm going to say, I want you to show me how this can do something that it wasn't designed to do. What else can it do outside of its four walls, outside of its remit, its description? And then adding to that, we want to explain to them that actually agility and flexibility is very important. And that's the uh, ability to take two things which are seemingly unrelated and, and perhaps build something good from them is very important. And then we found it, which is the ultimate in flexibility and uh, agility and so then we're gonna, I'm going to ask them to make something that makes these two things work together. Okay, so really what we have here is innovation and creativity coming together, two seemingly unrelated things and how can they do something extra, how can they do something else, which is great. So then how do we describe what creativity and innovation isn't? Well, it isn't making it sparkly, and it isn't something that you just sit up. And that was my yeah. teaching challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and Neil's is much more difficult than technical. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm a great believer in not hiding behind the terminology and the language that says of engineering. And engineering can be quite overwhelming because it has lots of maths, lots of, sort of scientific vocabulary. So I'm doing my PhD in deployable structures and I've got undergraduates and postgraduates looking at deployable structures and you have degrees of kinematic determinacy and static determinacy and these are like mind-boggling terms to describe. So what I try to do is try to find things I can describe these really difficult concepts to but in simple sort of language. So the first thing I did was I bought a one-dimensional pantographic structure also known as something that folds. <laughs> so what this is, it's all and folds, it's a carpenter's ruler, and if you're clever, you can make it fold into a straight line. So this is one dimension, it just works on one axis, and this is a pantograph. And I had to give a lecture to the ISRT in March next year, and to my students about how pantographs work. So I'm trying to explain how these work, and I always try and describe how things work, like the road runner, the boxing glove on the end of the glove, and shoot out and punch kind of in place. But not everybody knows who the road runner is, because not everybody's experienced my culture. So that's a rubbish analogy. If I can stand up and show one of these, pass it around. I won't then play it too much, because it's a pound, it probably won't last very long. <laughs> so that's my one-dimensional pantograph. So then I went all out, and I bought a two-dimensional pantograph. This is just boundless. So now it can unfold as a series of hinges, and it creates a plane, it creates a surface. So it could be a floor, it could be a wall, it could be a beam for a bridge. So I've got a guy who's doing his master's dissertation on making bridges work like this. And he's doing optimizations and sometimes we'll swap with some of these with cables. So now I have a one dimensional, I have a two dimensional pantograph, and I have a three dimensional one in my office called the Hoover Sphere. And when you pull it, it explodes into a massive dime. So now I can explain static determinacy, kinematic determinacy. 
how things deploy, I can talk about forces, and, and I can keep my dog safe if I leave my window open. <laughs> no extra charge. Okay? I also have a device where if it shoots some naughty, we can. <laughs> and then the other thing I really struggle with is, is that in engineering we talk about forces and talk about loads quite a lot. But actually, nobody really knows what a newton or a kilonewton is. So if I was talking about a newton, I, I use this quite a lot. So that's a newton. A newton is an apple. And the way that people remember this an apple is it's a rise up with a stupid um, force and a measurement force by an apple falling out of a tree and putting it on his head. And what I try and do is I let them remember that Sir Isaac basically was, was slacking. That's why he sat under a tree. You know, and had he come from um, Caribbean somewhere, it would have been a coconut. And we wouldn't have ever discovered that unit because he'd be dead, because coconuts are significantly heavier and harder. But when you come to look at what a killing unit is, well, that's a rugby player, I'm a killing unit, big guy is a killing unit. But when you buy your house, all of your house floors are designed to support a certain amount of weight, a certain force. But nobody really knows what the force is, one of the engineers. We're not going to tell anybody because then you can't make money from it. But the horse is designed for one and a half killing units a square metre, which doesn't mean anything to anybody. Until I say, actually, it's three ostriches a square metre. And I've been looking for a picture of an ostrich for months um, to try and describe. So three of these in a square metre is exactly what your, your living room floor and all your house's floors is designed to support. So trying to sort of communicate the idea of how big stuff is helps the students imagine. And when they get a number and quickly convert it into a thing, it comes out to be the moon, the chances are they've calculated it wrong, so it should be somewhere near an ostrich. So it's all about trying to provide that sort of transparency of thought of how does it really fit and try to give them that, that anchor point. So I try to do things with ostriches and think about things in terms of Harley Davidson's or whatever it is. So animals, I think about things, I get to do cars, or bikes, or people. It's all about trying to make it so they can grasp it. So how does it move? Well, actually, it only moves in one direction. How does it move? Well, it only moves in one plane. What's it equivalent to? Well, there's so many ostriches, but I do, I do have to stress them that they can't answer their exam paper in terms of ostriches. <laughs> I do expect some engineering language to come out in the exam paper, but the rest of the year you can make it any animal they want, I really don't care. So that was my thought process. Questions, observations? No, I, just, I like that because um, I don't have a good grasp of um, if someone said it's so many metres or it's so high, I, I, I struggle to understand that. Whereas when I know the time, I now know that it's 300 yards, 200 yards, 100 yards, so I now have a problem. If someone said to me that, or I know my husband's six foot, so if I'm thinking about feet, I think how many, how much higher would it be? I have to always relate it to something that means something to me because I have no concept of how high, how big, how wide. I think that's true. I think that's if you have no relationship with the thing that you're trying to learn, then you can't really learn. No. And I think that's one of the perhaps the challenges with the students is making them develop a relationship with what they're learning. Yeah. Actually, you know, being interested, being caring, visual learning, absolutely. Is, is Without digressing too much, but it reminded me as well of when I did some family work with some peer, family who had their daughter had schizophrenia. And the father was really struggling to deal with, to understand about what was going on and how the family were dealing with it. But, and then we realised he was a climber and he understood everything in climbing terms. So I asked him to teach me about climbing terms and what terminology we use. And if he set out um, climbing, would always know where he was aiming for or did he just set off? When we translated it into his terminology and we made him in, he kind of went, Oh, I get it now, and it made sense to him, but it meant folks were stuff that I had to learn about climbing, and then I helped him make the links, so that worked really, really well. It's finding a common language, isn't it? If they knew all the terminology, why are we teaching them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're coming here to grow, aren't they? Yeah. So we're taking them, we have to make it relate to their experiences, yeah. and they may not know who Thomas is, yeah. but actually, we just need to find a different way of yeah. We need to understand their culture. Yeah. Very good, good. Yeah, Thank it's you for It's going to be some similarities between your, yours and mine, but I'm applying, I'm applying mechanics to uh, biological materials, and I'm actually disappointed that Fiona managed to find <laughs> something similar to what I was actually looking for. So I, I ended up changing some of the reasons. Can I have a comment?